All right. Hey guys, welcome to the webinar. Uh, we are about to get started. I'm just going to wait a little bit longer to make sure that everyone gets here who wanted to attend and wanted to learn today about some cool features in Photoshop and InDesign. Um, I can see that there's already quite a lot of you just reached 200, the attendees, so that's good, but it keeps going up, so that's brilliant. So my name is Martin. I'm from, yes, I'm a designer. You might know me from my uh, YouTube channel. Uh, today we will have a live session and I'm going to show you some really cool stuff. But before we get started, just a couple of useful things that you might have seen already in the slides mentioned. If you have any questions about the things that I'm going to cover or in general about InDesign and Photoshop, um, use the questions box um, and leave comments, feedback, and as, as I said, or questions. Um, also, you will get the recording of the whole session. So I will be going quite fast and cover a lot of things. So if you want to come back and um, watch anything that I, I show you uh, in, and repeat it, you will get the recording in a follow-up email after this webinar. So don't worry, you don't have to take notes. <laughs> Just sit back, relax and enjoy the show. Um, also, in that follow-up email, you will get, um, besides the video recording, a 10% off voucher for all BenQ monitors, so the SWU, PD, and PV series, uh, professional monitors, and um, this will be valid for a month uh, from today, so that will be also included. And um, there will be some information on availability on the stocks, because obviously it's Due to the lockdown, there might be some shortages, but you will get some uh, more information on that as well. Now, on my screen, while I'm talking about these screens, uh, I just have a, like a little uh, reference of the setup that I'm using. And you can see all three of my workstations are the main screens, are all BenQ monitors. And um, they I mean, they are quite similar, the one on the, on the left, PD3220 and the uh, 3200. They're quite similar. However, the 3220 is slightly more uh, newer and it has a little bit more features. Uh, one feature in particular that I love is the uh, low blue light option, which you can very quickly just access by using the uh, hotkey puck. So you can program it and then switch switch quickly between the, the options there. I also wear normally these glasses just to filter out uh, the blue light. When you work long hours, uh, this is definitely something I recommend to have. But if you have screens that can get rid of the blue light, you don't even need these glasses. Now, I still use them because I have uh, additional screens like the iMac monitor, which you can't really change uh, to get rid of the blue light. So I still like to use the glasses as well. Um, so, but apart from that, obviously there's lots of very cool features like the USB-C connection. Uh, so you can easily connect a laptop and charge it, not just uh, have it uh, connected and use it um, together with it. So I use the, the BenQ monitor as a second screen. You can also charge your laptops uh, through it. And then there is on the right, uh, the SW321C, which just arrived recently and I have been testing it. And there is going to be a, a full review video on my channel soon. Um, this is a really unique monitor. Um, I just can't believe how good it is at uh, completely removing any reflections. So. I tried using even like flashlights and everything. Um, I have quite a bright studio, so I have quite a lot of lights going on. And even without the the shading, which, which you get with this monitor, and you can put it around it. So to create a frame, even without that, it's already amazing. It's almost like looking at the print. And uh, it's mainly for photographers, but uh, to be honest, this is actually amazing for digital art and graphic design as well. So I am going to review that monitor in more detail. Um, and if you want to find out more about these uh, screens, 
uh, I have already covered one of them, the one in the middle. Um, I covered that already in another review video. But without wasting any more time, we, I think, spent enough time now just to uh, go through everything as an introduction. And I think it's time, start, uh, it's time to get started. So let me jump straight into InDesign. Let's just start here. So in this session, I will try to spend the next hour really focusing on the techniques that I find useful when it comes to creating uh, compositions and layouts, specifically for magazines. Um, but I always like to spend some time on theory as well, instead of just purely uh, going through Photoshop and InDesign techniques, because the theory, if it's explained in a simple way, uh, can be just as important uh, for you to, to create interesting designs. So I use Milanote normally to put together uh, references and examples that I like. And uh, this is again another video which is coming up on our YouTube channel where I go in more detail on the anatomy of a magazine spread. So all the different details that you would normally have in a magazine spread. Uh, but I will show you a couple of these today because I am going to talk about it. So there's some really cool examples coming up, uh, which we will take a closer look at. But first of all, one of the most common things that you would need to do in a magazine uh, layout and in general in, in, um, in InDesign is to combine text and images somehow. Now, the most boring thing you can do is to have everything in very like visible blocks next to each other, especially like have an image with a background that's not even that interesting. Like in this case, this, this pineapple was already isolated from its background, but it's simple JPEG. So it's, it's, uh, uh, there's no transparency in it. So if I put this next to text, obviously it's not going to be interesting at all. And this is really, uh, the first and most basic thing that you can do in InDesign to make things a bit more interesting. So if you have a clearly defined object within an image, um, it doesn't have to be on wide background, but something that separates quite well from the background, then you can use the following method. You go into the window menu, and uh, actually you go into the object menu first, and you go through clipping path options. I normally use the shortcut for it, even though it's a little bit complicated, but there you go, that's the shortcut. Com command shift, command option shift K or control alt shift K uh, is the, the, the menu that you would need for this. And I think it's just not showing up right now because of my screen setup. That's a shame. Let me try it again if it comes up. Yeah, it's here. It was just hiding away. So. Uh, if I switch this to detect edges and I have the preview option on, you can see already that it can generate um, a clipping path from simply just det detecting the subject of the image. Now, this is not as advanced as Photoshop in detecting the subject, but it still does quite a good job. And you can see that you can vary the threshold. So increasing the threshold will increase the amount of details that are going to be hidden. And reducing that, we will start to see more of the details. Now, you can also include inside edges, which can take out even those sections in the middle, which would be similar to like using the magic wand uh, feature for the tolerance settings um, where you can again just jump through details and have the inside edges and then you can also play around with the tolerance with which you can increase or decrease the amount of anchor points that are created so this is a vector mask essentially that's created and once we click ok that's already quite cool so now i can just move the image and we can see that it really we, we got rid of that white background it's, as I said, not as accurate as doing it in Photoshop, but still gets you a quick result. And when you're working in magazines, sometimes you have to process hundreds of images that you have to go through. And um, sometimes certain details might be tiny, so they don't have to be like 100% precisely selected. So something like this could do easily in, a, in a, like a side panel or a box out detail within the magazine. But the other thing that you can do once uh, you use detect edges for uh, the clipping mask, you can also use the text wrap feature, 
which can make it more interesting and, and um, combine the text and the image together. So within the text wrap panel, you would just need to go into the third option, the wrap around object shape. And that, again, uses the detect edge path that was created earlier. And you can use these independently from each other so that you don't have to use them together. Uh, it just uses the same algorithm. But you can see, and uh, now I can also increase, decrease uh, the offset. Uh, so I can keep the text further away or closer to the pineapple image and I can then move the whole thing around and you can see how it's going to push the text away from itself. So first clipping path to remove the background and then text wrap detect edges to, um, to be able to create this result. Once again, if I go back to text wrap, you just have to make sure that it, the type is set to either detect edges or same as clipping. Okay, so I normally would use same as clipping if, if I already applied that to the image. But that's all I wanted to show you in this quick first example. But if you want to do a better job and if you want to create a professional combination of images with text in a bit more interesting way, usually you want to achieve some kind of depth in your composition. Like here's an example with a magazine cover. Where you see that the guy, the main character, is it feels like he's in front of the uh, main title of the magazine. And that's a very, very common technique with, with cover images. So you would have the hero image uh, integrated into the text. So you would have text on top, then the character, then some text behind, and then the original background of the image. And this is actually something I'm going to show you from, from to start out how, how to set this up. Uh, but first, I wanted to jump back to this example here because I want to make sure you understand the difference between these two main masking techniques. And believe me, masking is the key to make things look cool. And generally, any technique that uh, you would use in a magazine layout would involve masking in one way or another. And you will see all the examples I'm going to go through. I will always point out where masking is applied. So that's usually the, the twist that makes your composition more interesting. So that's why it's so important to learn these techniques. And without Photoshop, you wouldn't be able to achieve really good masks. So the two ways of doing things, one is a pixel mask or layer mask, it's also called. The other is a vector mask. So here I have an image on the right side, let's just start with this, which has already a clipping mask added to it. But this was created within Photoshop and not in InDesign. Let's just see what happens if we use InDesign uh, clipping path. So if I go into, once again, object clipping path uh, feature, here if I choose detect edges, okay, it doesn't even find any edges in this case because the object is just too similar to the background. So the color and contrast is not enough for InDesign to detect the, the, the object. However, if I already done my, my homework and prepared the path in Photoshop, which I will show you how it looks, I can call on that from within InDesign and just choose the path that I created. If there's an image with multiple paths, you can even name them and select them from here. So you can see I have a camera path created and I can still use things like insetting the frame. I can even go in minus directions and keep growing that uh, value. By the way, whenever there's a number within um, InDesign or Photoshop, uh, you can use up and down arrows to change it or shift up and down arrows to quickly increase, decrease the value. So that's what you see here uh, that I'm doing. So I'm just going to set this back to zero. So I don't need uh, inset. And if I click OK, that's essentially what we get. So if I move this over here and put it over the other image, you can see how nicely it's been uh, cut out. And this is really the advantage of using a vector mask because you would get these perfectly uh, created sharp edges. And even on details like here at the bottom, you can see all of those little bumps are perfectly selected. Now, this is something that you would do within Photoshop. And within Photoshop, this is saved as a path. So within the paths panel, this is what you are essentially creating. So when you use a tool like the pen tool, or even a simple tool like uh, the shape tools, I'll just show you how to get started. If you use the ellipse tool, let's just say, I'm gonna add the big ellipse here, and 
around the lens let's just say something like that for now and then i'm going to uh, show you like here in the pass panel you can already see it if i double click on this and let's just call it ellipse and save it oops i just spelt it wrong there you go so that's saved if i save this file it's a photoshop file by the way but you can even save parts within a jpeg um, so JPEGs can store multiple parts, uh, which is quite useful uh, to know. So now if I come back here and I go back to my uh, settings, clipping path, I can choose the ellipse option and you can see that's another mask saved within the same file. Now, of course, the best tool to use is the pen tool or a combination of the shapes and the pen uh, because you can combine multiple parts within the same vector mask. Um, and this is a, actually a quite complex topic. If you're interested to find out more about this, the video that came out this week on my uh, YouTube channel goes into much more detail on this. Actually, sorry, it was last week's video. So working with shapes and creating masks. But in a nutshell, you already seen here uh, what's important to know about uh, vector masks. And I'm just going to go back into Photoshop and undo these changes. So it should update as well here. Let's just update the image so we get the high resolution back. Now, when it comes to soft edge details then you most likely will need to use a layer mask or a combination of the vector mask and the layer mask so an object like that camera on the right we would normally call a hard edge detail so for hard edge details making selections you normally would use a vector mask on its own while here with the hair in particular but anything like grass a tree with leaves uh, and animals fur these would all be considered soft edge or my beard would also be soft edge um, so if you have an image which includes soft edges you would need to have an alpha channel or a layer mask created so i can show you this again i go into the clipping mask uh, or clipping path settings but in this case instead of detect edges or photoshop path you could use alpha channel and you can see it already comes up saying girl and i can again make changes here but i'm going to show you clicking away that it created a really nice edge so again nice edge around the body but very nice edge around the hair so once again if i go into photoshop by the way the shortcut i'm using is alt or option double clicking on the image which opens it up within uh, photoshop or illustrator if it's an illustrator working file that plays into indesign so once you have an image open you can see the mask or alpha channel within the channels so while a vector path is saved in parts um, or clipping path is saved there the alpha channel is saved within channels and uh, i can show you how it looks so that's the mask that was created and the way or the fastest way to create these type of selections is by using the subject select feature which has been improved a lot recently last week there was a big update to photoshop and the, generally to creative cloud and i don't know whether you noticed but even the icons got updated so we have new icons i actually quite like them um first i was a bit skeptical and i was missing that nice highlight or edge uh, or frame around the icons but i actually got used to it now and and it's it's grown on me so let me know what you think about the new uh, icons and in general um like all of the icons are obviously now a little bit more integrated um and also the creative cloud icon itself is uh, very nice and colorful now there's rainbow colors on it instead of just that strong red um, that we had before but besides the icons change um, what's more important is that we have this cool feature now uh, the subject select that got improved a lot so if i open this file let me just go into here i have an image um, so i specifically chose this image because it's not an easy selection so not only we have hair quite a lot of hair uh, once again i would consider these the soft edge details so i'm just going to draw here so this is soft edge this is soft edge okay and the rest 
I would say everything is hard edge detail. Um, maybe obviously he, here we have a little bit more hair and I think that's all. But yeah, so we have the um, soft edge details combined with hard edge details. So that's already makes uh, the, the selection if it's an automated selection quite uh, complex. But not only that, we also have a background that's quite similar in colors to the foreground. Plus also it's not just a single color, like a, a, a backdrop, like while well, I have this green screen behind me, but it's actually uh, add some details there. And um, it's quite like detail. There's a lot of little details. So we we'll normally call this a high frequency background. Uh, even though there's a shallow depth of field, it still makes the selection quite difficult. Now, let's see how the latest version of Subject Select uh, works. And this, by the way, is artificial intelligence. Uh, it uses artificial intelligence based on uh, Adobe Sensei. So it analyzes the image and understands what it can see in the image. So now if I go into the selection option called Select and Mask, you will see how this looks. So it created an amazing quality uh, selection, especially here on the right side. On the left side, there's a little bit of haziness in certain, uh, certain parts, but generally I think it really captured well the details that we needed. And around the, the clothes as well, I think this is the only bit here that needs to be added. So that's again something that we can easily do just using this selection brush. I'm going to paint over that and then that detail will be added there. Now, we can of course change our view within Photoshop. We can see it on black, we can see it on white. Let's just see the hair. I mean, that is quite a good selection there and completely automated. So all of this was automatically selected. Now, if I want to then uh, make changes, there's lots of additional options here. We can use the Refine Edge brush as well. We have now the object selection tool also here with which you can always refine details. So I can add or remove from the selection. Again, refine details like that one there. I'm just going to undo it probably here it was better and maybe just add a little dot in there. Now, if I want to refine this, or sorry, if I want to um, turn this into a selection or a mask, within the select and mask option, all you have to do is to choose new layer with layer mask. That's what I would normally use when, when it needs to end up in uh, InDesign. You will see why I use this one. So when I choose that, I click OK. And then you will see that you will have your background original image without the mask. And then I would normally call this new layer mask or uh, yeah, mask is what I would normally uh, uh, apply. So now that it's saved, we can actually save it as a JPEG and that's quite important. So it, it needs to be layered. And now that it's saved, we can jump back into InDesign. And remember that example that I showed with the cover now, I show you the layer structure for this. So within the layers, what I normally do is that I have my text on a separate layer on top. Then we have maybe a few graphics like this thing here. I would probably put it in the graphics and also the barcode should be on the graphics layer. It's good to separate things so I can have them turned off separately and the text as well. So, but these were all on top of everything. Then comes this sandwich of the two versions of the image and the text in between it. So this main title text in between it. So you can see if I turn off the layer on top, which says actor or main image, um, then we can see that the cinema text was on top of the original image. Now let's see if we build this up from scratch, what happens? So I select this image in the background and I'm going to drop our new PSD on it, all right? We just drag, uh, drop it in here and I will increase the size of it probably up to let's just say uh, come on shift drag and drag it in the middle something like that okay cool so it's already quite interesting how the scale of an image makes such a big difference. She looks so, so much more menacing having her larger, especially because she's looking down. So now she looks a bit more scary. Before when she was smaller, she didn't look that threatening. So scale obviously in composition is crucial. You really have to be good at defining uh, the scale. Sometimes 
even having like just a half of an image can be can be enough because your brain can can imagine then the other side of the person i mean it can it can always um uh, you can always leave it to the imagination uh, of your viewer to 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 finish an image. It doesn't have to be fully visible, but I'm going to keep it in the middle for now. And I will go into the options for this image by right-clicking and choosing Object Layer Options. And here you actually have access to the layers that you set up originally in Photoshop. So I can turn the background layer back and have the preview option on as well. So that actually shows the original image, right? But then we copy this whole thing. So I copy and go into this other layer and I'll just call this instead of actor, I will call it um, character or subject. Let's just call it subject, that makes more sense. And then on this layer, I will make sure we can see it. I will get rid of the original guy. And instead, I just paste in this image again. So the same Photoshop uh, image I paste in again. Now I will turn on the text behind this, but we can't see that text currently because it's covered up by this other image. But if I now go back again to object layer options and turn off the background layer, that's how we create that sandwich that I was talking about earlier. So now this second version of the image has no background, right? But because it's aligned with the other image, it just simply is placed on top and the text is in between the two images. And the good thing is that I can even select these two images, even though they are on two separate layers. And if I feel like the text wasn't legible enough, I can just push her down a bit having both of the layers selected. And of course, then comes all the graphics and text that we had originally that we can bring back. And there you go, there's a really cool magazine cover design. Now, let's move on and talk a little bit more about other techniques. Uh, still with masking, a very common thing that you can do with the same exact method that I just showed you, having a Photoshop file set up with two layers, the background layer and the layer on top, which is already masked out, you can create out of bounds effects so quickly and easily. So here we have the same photo. I just have two versions of it. This one is the one that's already uses the uh, mask version. So if I show you the layer options, same exact setup. So this one is using the mask version while this one is using the original one. If I align these two layers on top of each other, right? And then I select the original photo. I can just simply drag down this and create the out of bounds effect there. I could also go further down. And again, having the two layered on top of each other, we can very quickly create these cool techniques. And then of course, we can also add a corner radius um, and just create a little bit more interesting outline. We could reduce uh, the size of this frame and so on and so forth. Now, out of bounds effect, again, create some or add some depth to your compositions. And if you want to see some examples of this, some like professional examples, I can show you uh, a lot of these. So, for example, uh, let me just go into out of bounds. Uh, here, is a, here is a really nice one. So, this uh, spread, it, although it's very subtle, but it's a very important part here, uh, the, the, the depth that was created. So you can see that big uh, clock in the middle and how nicely the white line there on the top that runs across is showing up in between those gaps there. So that's again creates um, depth and, and creates the interesting combination of the images. It's not really out of bound, out of bounds, but it's just again overlaying things on top of each other and paying attention to these subtle little details. Now, if you want to be uh, more uh, more uh, obvious with this, you could even have that white line coming through here, so make it look like it's piercing through the clock. Uh, but I'm sure I can find another example. Uh, let me just go up. I think there were a few examples here of out of bounds uh yeah there you go so i'm just gonna zoom a little bit closer here 
uh, you can see the editor in this case or the uh, the author's uh, box that little image there if i just open this up in a new tab i can show you better uh, that one again is using out of bounds so very subtle and small detail but still important and then if we go back i'm sure there was another good example here somewhere of course this car image is also created in a way that it's the, the background original background is removed uh, but then we have lots of objects that are masked like these furniture here as you can see um, again masking uh, being crucial and let me just find i think That was a good example somewhere, but I just can't find it right now. But I will come back to this. Um, for now, I will just go back and show you all of them together. So uh, what I wanted to continue talking about are um, entry points. So besides masking, that's another, another very important thing you need to pay attention to when you design uh, magazine layouts. So entry points are the details within a magazine uh, that, or a, a spread that will draw people's attention. So for example, if you look at this spread here, you probably uh, will recognize the entry points. So we have the, um, we have the heading um, or, or title in this case, and then we have also just move things around a bit. So we normally would call that the headline on the left side, right? But then we also have the drop cap. Now this big letter in this case is not just a simple uh, font used within InDesign. It's actually a Photoshop composition. If I open this up, you can see how this was built. Once again, I use masking, but in this case, this is the third type of masking that's also important. It's clipping mask, which means that I used as the base of this design is actually a letter. So that's that's a, a font I really like and I use often. It's called Hevitas. It's a free font. You can find it online and download it. That's the name for it. So it's like heavy, but uh, Hevitas together um, written like that so this is my my base layer right and then i have on top of this another image layer this photo and all i've done is place them on top of each other and then hold down the option or alt key and click between the two layers in photoshop that creates the clipping mask so in this case the letter underneath is going to be the um silhouette or the outline and the image will be wrapped into the text and it's still an editable text so i could even change the text by using the type tool i can use another uh, character so on and so forth but more importantly i also used an effect called inner shadow uh, if i zoom a little bit closer you can probably see it better so when i turn it on turn it off right you can see that little detail there. So this makes it feel like there is again depth there. So it's almost like through this white piece of paper, we see underneath it and there is some nice nature detail there. So without that, it looks a bit flat, but with that subtle detail, it already looks a bit more interesting. But once again, what makes it more interesting is the out of bounds technique, with which in this case is very simple. All I have done is to place the same exact image again on top as a new layer. And then using a layer mask, I only show certain little details like these leaves. Now, the way you do that, I'll just show you very quickly. All you have to do is if I delete that layer mask, I'm going to hold down the option or alt key and click on the Japanese flag icon, the mask icon here in the layers panel that creates a completely hidden layer by using a mask that hides everything. And then I know where these leaves are, so I can just paint over them here on the mask by using white. So with white, I can just paint over them. There it is. If I use the X on the keyboard, I can hide away from these details and then just show that single little detail. Now, of course, I would spend a bit more time refining this, but hopefully you get the idea. So this is a very simple build again within Photoshop. And all you have to do is to 
create something like this and then place it into InDesign. And once you place it into InDesign, uh, I would normally have it as an have it set up the drop cap as an inset image. And the way that works is that you um, and not not just simply place the text, sorry, not just simply place it in and I use text wrap around it. Instead, instead, I would have it set up as an inset image. So the way that works is by placing the image in, cutting it out, double click inside the text and put the cursor at the beginning and there control or command V pasting the image in. Now notice that since I already set up a drop cap for this paragraph, the image automatically uses that drop cap feature. So if I go into the paragraph and change that setting, so here we have the uh, drop cap feature option. If I reduce the number, you can see how it's going to again adjust the text accordingly. So uh, it's a quite good combination of using drop cap and an inset image and the out of bounds effect so things are starting to already come together the things that we uh, we talked about now the other thing that is worth mentioning here is that there are like common rules that you should be um, paying attention to uh, one of the things that i very often see that um, people overdo the um, overdo the separation of elements within the body copy so it's a good thing to have well identified groups within your text but what you what you want to avoid is to be too obvious or um, over emphasize the separation of paragraphs for example that's the most common building blocks we have with text especially with body copy is our, that they are our paragraphs now one way of separating them is to use space between the paragraphs so that's very easy to set up within the paragraph settings you just use this option by the way that was also fairly recently introduced uh, before we only had space before and space after now we have also space between paragraphs so i can increase decrease that you can see how it's adjusting and uh, making the changes but the, uh, the other thing that you can also do is to have indents like these first line indents that we have here now you, normally if you have space between your paragraphs you don't need the first line indent so either use one or the other so in this case i would select both of these paragraphs and i would get rid of that first line indent so it first of all makes it a little bit more organized as well uh, keeping a nice left edge there but also it was completely irrelevant it wasn't necessary to be indented so if you have no space between the paragraphs so once again if i just go into zero space there then it would make sense to have an indent there on the second paragraph but once again not on the first one because there's already a space in between that uh, the first and second paragraphs so i don't want to go into too much detail on this but just try to keep in mind that the less is more in general in design so you don't want to over emphasize um, the 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 differences between certain details so it's important to have uh, it's important to have well-defined units and also have a hierarchy between your units but you don't want to be over over emphasizing them so try to be subtle that's like a general rule that always works now moving on here we have another quite nice example of uh, a combination of Photoshop and InDesign uh, for a drop cap that is using masking technique to combine an image with the drop cap. By the way, you can also see another out of bounds effect here used on this uh, skull on the right. Now, if I open this file here on the left side where we have our drop cap combined with the text wrap as well, if I open this up in Photoshop, you can see that the way this was built again is mainly relying on uh, layer masks and uh, clipping masks as well in this case so once again it's just a, a combination of all of the things that we already talked about so i am going to simplify this for you and show you uh, from from scratch essentially uh, what i would normally do so i delete everything and by the way masking 
one of the biggest advantage of doing it in Photoshop is that it's completely non-destructive. So either you are using layer mask, vector mask, or clipping mask, uh, they are all non-destructive techniques. So you can always go back and reveal the original details. Like here, you can see, I still have the original background. But what we would do, just like before, to get started with the subject select option. So we go to select, subject. Again, it should do quite a good job on uh, identifying the soft edges and hard edges and separating them and handling them differently. So here we can already see that we have quite a lot of soft edges, not just her hair, but also the fur she's wearing. And then we have also hard edges around the clothes further down. But now if I go into uh, creating a mask from this straight away by clicking on the mask icon here, we get that nice selection. And by the way, in Photoshop, if you alter option click on the mask icon, you can always double check the mask that was created. Once again, I think it's really, really good selection. I mean, look at that detail uh, there. And it was all automated uh, using artificial intelli intelligence. So saved us a lot of time. But now what we need is to also include some additional um, mask. What I want to do, or what, what I want to achieve, is to make it look like that um, her hands are in front of this V, but her body is going behind that V. And that's another thing that's very important to learn is that most of the time, if you want to create something a bit more complex and interesting, one mask is not going to be enough. You want to combine multiple layer masks. And the way you can do that is by using layer groups. So this is, this is, when I learned about this, or when I realized the importance of this, it completely changed the way I worked and it made everything so much easier. And I started creating much cooler uh, results. So let me show you how it works. So, so far it's very simple. We just simply use subject select and turn it into a mask, right? simple but now what i will do is press ctrl or command g to create a group you can also go to the layer menu and then choose uh, create group from there i don't even know where it is i, I never use the menus <laughs> uh, but i am going to then uh, create a mask on this group right just simply add the mask you don't even need any selection just simply add the mask now this mask is going to work completely independently from the other mask, but their result is combined. So again, white shows black heights. That's how the mask works. Currently, it's completely white, so it's, it's, it is showing every detail. But if I start using my brush tool, I can start deleting from this, all right? So I can delete from it, but what I will also do is to make a selection of the letter V behind her. And the way you can do that is by command or control clicking on the T icon of the text layer. Or if it's an image, you can click on the thumbnail. So essentially command or control clicking on the thumbnail makes a selection of the details. In this case, uh, these details that you can see on my screen. And I can just very quickly paint over it while still at the same time paying attention to where the arm is. So I don't want to delete that. And also here on the right side, I want to keep the sword visible. Okay. And the scabbard. And on the right side, again, the sword keep, no, actually the sword can go behind the text, uh, the, the letter. It's just her arm that I want to keep in front. And once again, you can see, you don't have to be 100% perfect with this selection because no one will really notice um, the, that, that in the final result. So I've done it very quickly and very, uh, just roughly what we needed. Maybe here a little bit I can remove from it. And then I will get rid of my selection, Command or Control D, right? And then still within the same group, layer group mask, I can now start removing all of these details. And I'm just using a very big brush and I'm using a mouse, so I'm not even uh, going to be that uh, precise. Um, and I'm not going to uh, finalize this. But you can see the best thing about using two masks, and this is what I meant, um, why it's so important. Because if I go too far and I end up messing up the lovely third detail that we have there, I can always 
press X on the keyboard and simply reveal it without revealing the original background. Because we have two levels of masking. The original mask was to separate the, the subject from the background. The second mask is just to further refine the details that we wish to see, right? So I can very quickly come back and maybe show all of this detail here and then just cut it down there. So that way it seems like it's part of uh, the dress and it ends there. And then of course, if I zoom closer, reducing the brush size, uh, I can further refine this and of course, get rid of details inside here or maybe just on the right side there and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to, again, uh, refine this too much, but you can already see how much better it looks if I just remove that. We essentially have the combination of the image and the text. Then the last thing that I would normally do is to add some shadow or cast shadow onto the text, because if you create the, um, create the, the, the look where it feels like something is combined with something else, in this case, the character with the text, you also want to make it look more realistic by really thinking about light and how light would work. So car shadow in this case would be probably here under the arm and also somewhere around here. So to create that, we just create a new layer. I will call it shading right and then we use the brush tool i would normally pick a color from the image maybe this brown color here a darker brown color okay and then using a soft edge i'm using control option click up and drag uh, click and drag up and down with the uh, brush tool and then i would just paint over here around the edge and then somewhere around there. And this layer can be set to multiply blend mode. So it just blends a little bit better. This was without uh, multiply and this is with it, right? It's a, another cool thing in Photoshop. Recently, they uh, it was introduced that you can get a preview with all the blending modes. So you can very quickly to toggle or uh, hover over the ones that we have in the list and you can see immediately the results but I will stick to multiply. And I think that creates a quite nice effect once again, without the shading and with the shading. And when it's ready, we can just get rid of the white background and then place this into InDesign, which you can already see here. The only additional thing that I've done here is to use text wrap to keep the text uh, away from the image. So if I come closer and move this image around, you can see how it's affecting the text. That's already something we've seen earlier on. So hopefully now you can see how everything is coming together. The things that we talked about um, in general, working with text and images in combining them together, but also creating interesting focal points, focal points that draw people's attention. And when they open a magazine and they see a spread, it immediately grabs their attention and they want to get started from that point. So in this case, this huge drop cap that I added on the left is not only a drop cap, but also uh, shows a very interesting image uh, which obviously is about the article that is covered in this case, uh, adventures or Vikings uh, in this case. Now, drop caps, of course, doesn't have to be, they don't have to be so aggressive. They can be very subtle as well, like this one here on the right side. Uh, it's it's It goes better with this design in this case. Um, so obviously it uses the same color. It has a has a nice unity with the left side of the spread, uh, but it's just a simple text placed behind the body copy. And if you use a subtle enough color, um, your body copy will be easy to be, uh, to be read. Uh, so it's still legible, but again, we have a good strong uh, entry point with the drop cap created like this. Um, Another thing here, we have obviously a large drop cap again. Remember what I said about scale. So if you want to have a large drop cap, uh, you can create something like this. Let's say this size already works. But if you have the luxury of have, having a huge empty negative space in, in, in your first page of an article, then why not go crazy and create a massive drop cap? something like that, where the letter doesn't even uh, fit on the page. It has to be cropped slightly to the left. 
once again, remember the brain will connect those details and it will be able to, uh, the, the, your viewer will be able to imagine what's left out from that drop cap. And all you have to do is to create your text wrap. Now, what happens if you are using a text wrap on another text? So in this case, this character here, if I set it up with text wrap, right? If I choose uh, use wrap around object shape, in this case, I don't have any contour options, right? Uh, I could I could go through these settings, but there's not not really any contour options because it doesn't recognize the text outline as a contour. One thing that you can do is to turn it into outlines, so to create outlines from this text, um, which you can do by going into Paths, Open Path, uh, but that's going to lose the editability of the text. So I'm going to actually go back, and instead, in these cases, what I prefer to do is to create um, a separate shape. Normally, I would use the pen tool, so I would just draw a path from the top to the bottom and then create the shape, maybe going left and up and then close it. So that empty, an empty shape, which then I can set to object, uh, wrap around object shape, increase maybe the offset, and there you go. It's not a visible object because it's completely transparent but it can create the same effect the text wrap that we were looking for so just remember to, normally what i would do is to combine these two objects together into a group control or command g just like in photoshop and that way when i move it around uh, it's going to create um, a larger text wrap in this case okay hopefully that made sense as well and i am going to show you Another example, um, this one is not that interesting. Uh, I had another example which I wanted to finish on, and that is the data merge feature, and then we will have some time for going through your questions. So this is just the last little example of uh, InDesign's, uh, one, of, one of my favorite features in InDesign which can be used for automation, and it's called data merge. Now, this particular example is not for magazines, but uh, it it is great for things like business cards, uh, where you can create a template, like what you can see on my screen, where you have the front and back of a business card. This can be created in Illustrator, like this. This is an Illustrator file, but the text is actually added as a text frame here within InDesign on top of the Illustrator artwork. So this page is already set up and I actually already populated this frame with these data merge um, tags or elements. So if I go into the window menu and on the utilities data merge, I can show you that these are the uh, elements, right? And there is already a text file that I imported in here. Uh, I can show you that text file as well separately. So data merge, employees. So we have a simple text file created, which can be exported from Excel. Um, you just have to make sure that your first row has the definitions that you will be using within InDesign. So the name, job title, email address, phone, phone number. It can even pick up images if you use an at sign, but uh, in this case, it's just simply copy. And then we have several rows of information. So all of this information then can be populated through the data merge panel. I can turn on the preview and you can see it generates or brings in those that information from the text file. So I can even go through all these uh, different uh, versions and I can see how it's going to be populated. And whoever is a gamer will probably recognize these names uh, from an amazing game called Red Dead Redemption 2. So um, that's just, a, just another quick thing I wanted to point out uh, within InDesign, even though it's not magazine, a little bonus tip at the end. So. Uh, we have five minutes left, uh, but we don't have a hard stop, so we can always spend a little more time if there's more questions. So I would like to have a look at the questions right now. So let me let me go through them, and I will make this a little bit bigger. All right, so I can see it better. 
and feel free guys if you have any more questions you can still ask them so okay okay these are at the beginning just questions about technical issues okay so marine marina uh, was asking about which layers are inside the group um, i guess that question was closer to the end so most likely is going to be the question asked about the viking example but marina you can let me know if if i'm wrong uh, the only layer that's within the group is the uh, the image layer uh, the one that's called color balance but i can just call it viking uh, so you can see that that's the only layer in, inside it so the text doesn't need to be within that layer group the text doesn't need to be uh, masked it's just the image itself so the image already had a mask on it on it which was hiding its original background but then this additional mask that we added on the group is to hide the further details that we needed in this composition um okay now perfect okay how do you change victor is asking how do you change the color of highlighted menu selections highlighted menu selections um i'm guessing that was a question for uh photoshop Let me change the color of highlighted menu selections um do you do you mean like actually going into here and changing the menu selections like like this color this gray color i'm 100 percent sure what you mean or do you mean the layer selections um i'm not sure victor what you mean if you can ref just uh, give me a little bit more information on what you meant by that um my youtube channel's name is yes i'm a designer here on my cap <laughs> uh, you can see it um, I guess I can share that with you all here in the chat. Uh, let me just drop the link in there. If you haven't seen my channel yet, I will share it in the chat. Okay, there you go. Um, cool. So here's another question from Constantine. Uh, if I want to place black text over a big black letter, is it possible to make the text on top to be uh, white? Let's say um, the example that this could be applied to is the slide with that huge drop cap letter V. Hope that question makes sense. Yeah, of course. I mean, like um, if we go back to that example that I had there, let's just jump back in here. I think it was this one most likely um, if i go into this and i'm going to select that text and maybe make it a bit more bold uh, so instead of using this i can use uh, ultra black and then increase the size so when you're using a very thick text like that you can of course have your body copy uh, placed on top of it and just simply have the text set white so as another useful shortcut in InDesign um, when you have a text range selected by default normally InDesign wants to change the color whether it's the fill or the stroke of the frame not the text inside the frame but if you press J on the keyboard notice how it changes having the fill and the stroke colors of the frame visible right now but if I press J it jumps that's how I remember it J for jump to the um, colors of the text within the frame uh, the same thing you can access by these little icons here but it's just annoying if you have to do that all the time so I always just use the shortcut so having jumped to uh, the text color I can just change it to paper in this case and I'm going to make sure it's placed in the right layer so if I drop it up here you can see how it's going to work and I'm just going to get rid of the drop cap uh, sorry the, the text wrap in this case uh, which we still have that shape there which we don't need right now okay um, and by the way if you want the text to be um, following the shape of the letter then you can also have it uh, following it 
very easily by just using the direct selection tool, select the bottom two points of the frame and simply drag it to the left. Look at that, how quick and easy that is. So using the direct selection tool, align it to the text frame and you can even select individual points. And this is almost like an inverted text wrap, right? Because we, what we are doing here is we are creating a shape, a unique frame uh, for the text. I hope I, I hope I understood correctly what you were asking, Constantine. Uh, I think this is this is what you meant. Hopefully, uh, Dusan is asking. I don't have questions, but thank you. That's great. I'm glad you liked the tutorial uh, webinar. Um, Ismail is asking. Um, how can you get rid of the center column stroke in tables? Center column stroke in tables. Uh, yes, so when you are working uh, with tables, there's one thing that you have to do, um, which is going to create a new page. So you can yeah, see this quickly. So I will create a table, let's say four by four and define it here. Okay, so the way you can change uh, details or the, the the edges is that you first of all need to select everything that you want to affect in this case you can also if you want the whole table to be affected just click on the top left corner of the table when you see that cursor currently visible on my screen that's the way you can select the whole table and then this little bit here on the top is what you need to check you have to make sure that the outer edges are not selected so you remove the highlights from them you highlight the inner edges and then you reduce the value to zero, or you can set the color to something more subtle, maybe like something like that, and 0 0.25, and then it should be much more subtle. I think it's just too, too uh, faint, but yeah, you can see it now. It's not as strong as the outer edges. Once again, having double clicking on the text frame, clicking on the top left corner, making sure you highlight only the inner edges and then you remove the stroke and that's that's basically it but you still have you still have a grid so if i use the tab key you can see i have cells still even though we are not seeing any edges and the same way you can also change the outer edge of your table so ismail hopefully that made sense um darlene is asking um yes it's recorded the webinar is recorded um and yeah i know i went through a lot of things very quickly so you will get the recording at the end of this uh, webinar which you will get an uh, an email with the link to the recording okay we have another question from ethel is there any website you recommend to look for inspiration when creating layouts for magazines um okay so I am actually uh, going to cover this in a video coming to the channel in a couple of weeks' time. So uh, remember I mentioned this Milano board um, where I show a couple of examples. In that video, I'm going to mention a few artists that I recommend. I actually haven't found any good uh, websites for magazine spreads. I found, however, a good website for magazine covers. Um, so you were asking about layouts. I actually normally do a uh, search on Behance. Um, Behance, you probably are familiar with what, if not, I can share the uh, link here in the, again, in the chat. So Behance is Adobe's portfolio site and uh, like a community site where creatives share their work. Um, and I normally would filter for uh, layout or editorial design is what's the best way of searching for it. And then if you find an artist that you like, normally I would, what I would recommend is to check out their work maybe even beyond um, Behance because to be honest, art directors are normally the best ones to find. If you find, find art directors uh, for magazines that you like, uh, like for example, in this case, one, one, one of these guys, Kevin Fay, is, is a brilliant artist. Uh, I'm going to just share this link quickly as well. Um, so he's an art director, Kevin Fay. Uh, no, that's not copying it yet. Let me just try to open this and then copy it in 
So he's he's um, he's he's he has done a lot of uh, work for various magazines. Uh, okay, I actually put the link in multiple times, but uh, but yeah. Uh, if you wait for that video that will come out soon on that, on the channel, um, I will be covering more of the uh, the sources. And uh, let me just quickly find this other link for you. I actually have a link for the magazine covers that I just mentioned. And uh, just one second. So magazine cover. It's called Cover Junkie. That's the one. So. Here you go. And this is this is for covers, not for layouts. But once again, like this, this is a huge uh, database of of current and old magazine covers as well. So let's see. Hopefully, I thought that made sense. Um, cool. And then Stephen. Uh, oh, Stephen, I recognize your name. I think you are one of our members. Uh, we have, by the way, a, a membership on uh, our site, yesamidesigner.com, where we review people's work. Uh, so if you want to show me the work that you do, you can um, find out more about this. Let me just share this link quickly as well with you all. Uh, so you can find out more about it if you're interested. So that's the membership. We call it Pro Membership. and this is for people who would like to have a bit more than just simply accessing all of the courses that i made but also um, have some feedback on their work and help with portfolio building and stuff like that so steven is one of our members by the way um, yes yeah, so within design he's asking if if i wanted to place a vector image in the working file i guess what file type should i use so the image remains resolution independent uh place the illustrator file stephen use the ai format that's that's the best you can also use um eps if you want but uh, the ai native illustrator file format is the best that's going to be the best for color management as well but also for keeping it resolution independent however um you will probably have a couple of options in the beginning when you place it in that it's going to ask you. Uh, I think it's quite straightforward and uh, you can't really mess it up. So if you use AI, that's probably the best format to work with. Okay, and then I can see that's probably uh, just answering to some of the things that I already mentioned. Um, Yeah, there is a, another question. I will probably spend another couple of minutes going through the remaining questions. Um, so I can see people are signing out as well. Uh, whoever uh, watched the webinar and doesn't want to go, uh, doesn't want to wait for my answers to the questions, um, I thank you so much for your attention and I'm, I'm, I hope you found this useful. And uh, let us know if you want to see more of this type of content, and then hopefully we can arrange some more webinars in the future. And also topics that you are interested, you can always uh, let us know, uh, even here in the in the questions area. So let me go through a few more questions. So there's one about uh, uh, one from Ayrton from Malta. Uh, Malta is a beautiful place. I wish I could go there uh now it would be lovely in this weather um after removing the background after clicking subject how did you refine the layer uh press something um yeah um sorry i i don't think i will be able to repeat the whole process but you will be able to watch the recording and i hope it will make sense um so make sure when you get the email just watch the recording and uh, if you still have trouble just email me and i can i can always help you about um explaining that in, in more detail but i think once you watch the recording it should make sense um cool anyone who's asked or just saying they they love the webinar i'm really glad you enjoyed it um luke is asking how do we get one of the nail caps we don't actually have this cap yet um for sale but we've been planning to uh to to have it we have some t-shirts um on our YouTube channel that you can buy. 
Um, but we are we are probably going to do one of these as well and uh, make it available. So keep an eye on the YouTube channel. Uh, we have merch there. There's some really cool T-shirts. Uh, but yeah, the cap I I think is going to be the next one that we will add. Um, oh, there's an interesting question from Noor: How to grayscale in InDesign? How to turn an image into grayscale? I guess that's what you're asking. So if you ever want to do that, what you can do is to create a big rectangle over an image, right? Fill it with black. Uh, so the fill color, color needs to be uh, black and then what you need to do is to go into the opacity options which you can access by uh, going into the effects icon transparency and then set the blend mode to color and if you turn on preview you'll see the grayscale effect <laughs> it's as simple as that so create a big black box set it to color in the blend mode through transparency from the fx menu and then place it wherever you want it like here i have it on the image but if i place this on top of everything else even text will turn grayscale right and you can of course play around with this it doesn't have to be black you can also use it to create these overlay effects uh, which can also be quite cool hopefully that makes sense okay another Another question, let's see. Um, uh, Stefan is asking, if we have a logo and behind we have an image that has a similar color as in the logo, making it harder to read, what is the solution? Um, yeah, in general, when you're layering things on top of each other, most important thing is to uh, establish contrast. So there's many ways of doing that, but um, I would I would always recommend like here for example in this uh, this image this text special doesn't read well because it's too similar to the background so it's usually to do with how you use colors but of course you can always use a, like a, a shape to separate things so in this case if I use uh, once again a black box and place it behind it uh, that's already going to separate it better of course it's going to be too strong in this case so the box can be reduced in opacity but that's just a very uh, very basic technique there's so many other ways of, of uh, establishing the contrast um, so uh, this is actually also something that I covered in a couple of videos already on our channel so um, I, I recommend checking checking them out there was one recently about uh, five compositional techniques with Photoshop um, if you look for that video you can learn about ways of having text on images where it's hard to read and then how to create a nice combination so uh, that video is probably the one I would recommend for you to check out um, yeah so I already shared uh, I already shared my YouTube channel and then just let's let's say two more questions and then I will wrap up because we are running out of time um, I wish we had more time to <laughs> uh, for me to respond to everyone but uh, it's also getting late here um, uh, I can see another question okay these are actually just comments now all right cool I think that's all we had time for sorry if whoever had further questions that I didn't respond to. It's not that I'm ignoring you. Uh, I would love to respond to everything in more detail, but um, if it's important what you're asking, you can always ask me on the YouTube channel as, as a comment, but probably the best thing is to email me. It's info at yesimadesigner.com. Um, and then I will hopefully be able to help you and, and uh, give you some, some guidance. Cool. So once again, guys, thank you so much for your attention today. Have a lovely evening or morning, wherever you are based in the world. And uh, stay safe, stay healthy, um, and uh, stay creative. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks again, and hopefully see you soon.